Hi, my name is Paul Ramirez, and you're listening to the Chicago Singer Songwriter Podcast. Hey, this is Chris Dever, and you're listening to the Chicago Singer Songwriter Podcast. I'm here with Paul Ramirez. Paul, hi, how are you tonight? I'm doing all right. How about yourself? Excellent, excellent. Uh, Paul came all the way down from where you at? What neighborhood are you at? Jefferson Park. Jefferson Park, down to my place in Pilsen to record tonight. Um, we are right by the L track, so you'll hear some rumbling in the background whenever the train goes by. But it's uh, just unfortunate circumstance of being in Chicago. Um, so I met you, Paul, doing open mics. You used to come to Nightcap, where I used to host an open mic night. And then you host an open mic at Sylvie's up on Irving Park. Um, actually, I think we first met at an open mic at Lily's. Was it Lily's and first? And I let you borrow my guitar. Or no, capo. I don't oh, know, one of those things. Yeah, in any that's case. That's right, that's right. Yeah. And then, uh... And then you came to Nightcap, and then you told, and then you told me about Sylvie's. Yeah, and then you came to Sylvie's. That's right. Are you still doing the Sylvie's thing? Uh, no. No. Um, I just got too busy. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it was hard for me just to even do it only once a month. And so I just had to call it quits from there. Uh, yeah. We had a, we had a few good nights, um, met a lot of interesting people, um, and a couple of friends came to stop by and say hi and maybe play a song or two, but it was good while it lasted. Yeah, but, it was uh, mostly mostly low key though. You didn't have like the crazy crowds that like the other cabaret or Lily's has. No, which would have been cool, but you know. But it was very much a songwriters open mic where you got to play a bunch of songs and everyone was there listening and critiquing and um, networking. Yeah, which was kind of nice for yeah. that, that small crowd, which was really cool. Mm-hmm. So how did you get started in music, Paul? Um, music's always been a pretty big part of my life. Um, I remember the first instrument I ever learned how to play was trombone. Um, oh, that was too. like in grade school. Yeah, trombone's awesome. <laughs> I wish I had one. Um, Do you remember what got you interested in playing trombone? I just liked that it was an unconventional horn, and it can be loud, and... You know, just from the looks of it, I thought, yeah, I think I could play this. The size and the power of the instrument. For me, yeah. it was uh, my band teacher when I was trying out instruments, I think it was in sixth grade, um, said that with the way the mouthpiece is and the way you have to play it, it softens up your lips and it'll make you a better kisser. <laughs> so I was like, sold. So that's how I got into it. All right. So cool. So you played trombone for how many years? Uh, pretty much from fourth grade up until eighth grade. And then... I stopped after that because the trombone wasn't mine. <laughs> it was the school's. Oh, yeah, so, that'll do it. So, yeah. So I stopped after that. Um, and then I picked up a guitar um, my senior year in high school. So you didn't do anything through most of high school? Didn't um, do any garage bands? Well, I, or? well no. Actually, I, uh, well, I joined the choir um, in high school. I also sang a bit at church. So you were still um, singing. Yeah. Um, like, I grew up, like... Even though I don't, it doesn't show on stage because uh, most of the stuff that I play would be either like folksy stuff or if I'm with my band, uh, the Bannerman, it would be kind of like fast and loud. Um, but when I was, you know, in the early, growing up in the early 90s, the biggest musical influences to me once I became a teenager were, you know, the R&B from the 90s, like Boys to Men, Babyface, Shy. Uh, to me, those guys were amazing. Um, and it wasn't until I got older that I started delving into, uh, the older stuff. Um, like, you know, the Temptations, Marvin Gaye. Uh, so I was really heavily into R and B. Um, but once I started playing the guitar, I started veering towards rock music, uh, folk music, um, and then somewhere along the way, I decided, well, I like R and B, <laughs> and so I started to force myself to learn how to play that kind of style with a guitar. So, um, a couple years back, I signed up uh, for a class at the Old Town School of Folk Music that taught uh, Al Green, <laughs> and 
I loved it. So since then, it's like, all right, I could do this. So then I started challenging myself more to learn some, you know, that style of music. Because, you know, some people might take issue with this, but I think rock music is pretty easy to play compared to uh, the R&B style. What would you say uh, R&B has that the rock music doesn't on guitar? Um, funny chords and unique rhythm. <laughs> Um, with R and B, it's heavily bass driven. So the guitar, you kind of have to force yourself to think outside the box. So let's say, um, if the bass player is holding down the root note of, let's say a B or a B minor, but like the chord chart would say B minor nine. So you're going to have to teach yourself how to like mute strings you know, and just play certain strings, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, as opposed to rock music, which is mostly power chords or open yeah, chords. Okay. Yeah. Um, but don't get me wrong. I love, I love rock music. Uh, I remember once I started picking up the guitar and I started learning how to play, you know, music more suited for the guitar that was popular at the time, I was really into uh, like Pearl Jam, Nirvana, Alice in Chains. Um, and then... You know, since I'm a singer, you know, I did like the stuff from the 80s. So, yeah, I love Bon Jovi, uh, Guns N' Roses. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, I think uh, there's a different skill set involved and a different mentality uh, when you're playing R&B compared to rock. Um, and, uh, you know... Granted, I'm probably not going to write an R&B song because, well, a lot of them tend to be sappy love songs. <laughs> and uh, since I haven't been in too many relationships, it's just not there for me. Got to get so, your heart broken once or twice before you can get there. Yeah. <laughs> um, or like, uh, well, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. But I love it. Um, I still have my old CDs from the 90s, you know, so I still have all of Boys to Men's albums. I have quite a few baby face, uh, but uh, yeah. So, but yeah, like I said, uh, the older I got, you know, the older my tastes have become as well. Um, so like, you know, my new favorite band is an old band called The Who, and I'm glad that they're still touring. Uh, I think that's awesome, considering they're both, well, the remaining members of The Who are like 70, or yeah. pushing 70. and luckily it was like the two main guys that, that stayed around. Well, I wouldn't say the main guys. Uh, each of them had their own unique flavor. I mean, when you think about Keith Moon and John Entwistle, the ones that passed away, uh, John Entwistle and Keith Moon, those are the two people that got me cued in to what the who were um before i saw any old concert footage like on occasion i might listen to a song on classic rock radio or whatever where okay i hear you know pinball wizard or i hear um you know i could see for miles some of some of the more poppy songs um and for a while i was like okay yeah they're a couple catchy tunes but then um, I actually saw footage of one of their older concerts, and when I saw John Entwistle playing the bass the way he plays that bass, I was dumbfounded. And uh, and then of course when Keith Moon, he would be wailing on the drums like as if he had eight arms, and he wouldn't even be looking at his drum set half the time. He would be looking at Pete Townsend, uh, looking for cues during those jam sessions and whatnot. But like. You know, he he just had that instinct, you know, and I don't know. And he also, you could tell when he's playing the drums, he doesn't have a serious look on his face the way a lot of drummers kind of zone in and just kind of get into their little zone. Keith Moon would always try to engage everybody in the arena. So he would, he would, you know, be making funny faces at the band members. He would be making funny faces at the crowd, all the while doing all this wacky stuff for the drums. And so it was that joy that Keith Moon brought, not to mention, of course, just the way John Entwistle played. You know, that's what drew me to The Who. And uh, so to me, The Who, you know, will always be my favorite band. Um, 
But uh, but yeah, you know, those are just some of the people that I like to draw inspiration from. Very cool. And you mentioned that you took an Al Green class at the, um, the Old Town School. You were in a, a Who Ensemble. That too. As well, right? Um, the Who Ensemble was uh, the first ensemble class that I took at the Old Town. And that um, was actually my first time experiencing, you know, playing my instrument with a group of people. I mean, not not to exclude when I played trombone back in the day with uh, the concert band or whatever, but uh, but when I started playing guitar, um, you know, being surrounded by other really good musicians, um, you know, accompanied with bass drums uh you know that was like my real my first real experience playing music that i liked and you know surrounded with other people playing music that i liked and so um so that was great and one of the greatest things that i got from being in that class was um well i was able to be i guess more exposed to some of the who's deeper cuts um, as well as meeting my bass player who is in my band, you know, that I met and the Who Ensemble. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, F- I remember uh, the Who Ensemble, you know, it didn't last for for a long time. But uh, but afterwards, like, me and the bass player, we, uh, his name's Matt, by the way. Um, he, uh, he and I exchanged information and I asked him, if and when I start a band, would you be willing to join me? And he said yes. So, like, all right, cool. I'll keep that in mind. And so I had him in my back pocket for a while. Um, and, you know, me being a, a product of the 90s, uh, I took a 90s ensemble class also at the Old Town. And the cool thing about ensemble classes, you know, you know, I, I experienced firsthand when I joined the Who Ensemble was that you're amongst people that like the same music and you already have that connection. And so with the 90s ensemble, uh, we all had that connection. And, you know, they're a great group of people. Um, we're all friends on the Facebook. Uh, some of them come to my shows with the Bannerman. Um, on occasion, I might see them at the Grafton Pub, which is right across the street from the Old Town. Um, you know, they're, they're great. And I encourage anybody that wants to try to play in a band environment to... Uh, to go to the old town. Um, or if you want to just like brush up on some skills that, you know, you need to work on. I know I have, um, you know, that's a great place. Um, but yeah, with the nineties ensemble, I met my, uh, my first drummer, my first lead guitarist. And so, uh, so yeah, um, it's a cool place, supporting environment, uh, great people. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that's that's the old town. Um, and you might just meet your future bandmates there. So let's get into your songwriting a little bit. When did you start writing songs? Um, I started dabbling in songwriting, I want to say in like the early 2000s. Now, granted, a lot of those songs that I've written around that time, I pretty much scrapped. It was, it's kind of one of those things where... And I'm sure you've experienced this as well, because, you know, you're an experienced songwriter. Um, you first write a song, you know, it's work. You know, you put the time into it. You try to think, okay, what's a catchy melody, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, you finish your work. You think to yourself, yeah, this is pretty good. The next day, you play it, and then it's not so good. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, it was just that trial and error type thing. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much it. It's, you know, it is definitely a process, um, that I, you know, I'm far from perfecting. Um, in fact, to this day, I really don't have a conventional process. Um, a lot of people try to suggest, well, maybe you should start with, uh, the chord structure first, or maybe you should just jot down some random lyrics. Um, I've done that, but it's never really worked uh, as far as, you know, well, it's hard for me because I do, like, my my job keeps me fairly busy. 
Um, sometimes not so busy, but I do find myself on the road quite often. And sometimes when I find in my head a catchy tune or whatever, it's like, all right, I'll try to keep this in my head for as long as I can. And as soon as I get home, it's gone. Um, but the vast majority of the songs that I wrote are pretty much when inspiration strikes at the right moment and at the right, you know, at that perfect moment where you're not doing anything, you're home and you have paper and a pen handy, that's when, that's when it hits. That's when I start. And so you, you, you get the inspiration when you have paper and pen in front of you? Not necessarily. Well, not necessarily in front of me, it's but like, handy. I never had that happen to me. It, when, like if, I never said in front of me. It's like when I have <laughs> access to. Got so it. if I'm at home, I know where things are. So if inspiration hits, I'm going to stop what I'm doing, whether it be watching TV or playing the video games, and I'm going to write that song. That's in my head at that moment because it's I'm my time is freed up, you know. Uh, I remember, um, and yeah, there was a time where I actually wrote a song at work, which was the first song that I played. Um, it was just one of those things where I knew that I was not going to be busy, that I had more free time at work that I know what to do with. It was just a slow season, I guess. And uh, I brought my guitar with me. Um, and I was looking at three hours of free time that I didn't need. Uh, so that's when I wrote that song, It Is What It Is. Um, and uh, I guess... What inspired me to write that song was extreme boredom at the time. So I figured, well, I'm at work. I might as well be productive. Maybe not work productive, but at least I'm entertained for the time being. And so that's when I wrote that song. And that was actually the first song that I was happy with. <laughs> and this was back, gosh, I want to say 08 or 09 when I wrote that song. All right, well, let's take a listen to It Is What It Is. Tell you've got something to say About how this life isn't going your way But I came to tell you Things will get better someday The hope that I'm giving you may not appear But I came to tell you what you need to hear This life isn't perfect Things will get better someday when the clouds keep gathering I can feel the water rising I can hear the wind blowing We seek shelter in the hope of nowhere the storm will pass You seek absolution while hiding your tears You try to act brave but have nothing but fear Just tread in water, things will get better someday It is what it is and it's not ours to change all that we have are the broken remains Of a life that we wanted Things will get better someday As my mind keeps wandering I can feel the water rising I can hear the wind we seek shelter in the hope of nowhere the storm will pass the storm will pass i can feel the water rising i can 
seek shelter in the hope of nowhere the storm will pass so what kind of job do you have that you're able to take three hours off just to write music that sounds like the dream <laughs> i do physical therapy okay so in between clients you're able yeah to... pretty much um I was working at an office that just wasn't busy. Um, we were closing that office down, and I was just finishing off the, the patient load there. And so when I was, like, when I knew that I was looking at a long stretch of time in a suburb that was way too far to begin with, um, I figured, well, I'm going to be stuck here for a while, so I'll bring my guitar with me. And uh, I wrote the song at work. Um and yeah, it was boredom that inspired that song. <laughs> so being that it was six, seven years ago now, um, when you play that song, you, does it bring you back to that place that you were at? Yes. You're sitting in the office, like thinking about whatever. I I remember exactly what I was thinking. Um, I like to listen to a lot of different musical genres. Um, so of course, rock and R and B are going to be like my favorites, but. Um, I do have a, a real appreciation for, uh, country music. Um, what like, am I, f- like modern country music? No, no, cool not modern. I mean, music. real country music. When I think, when I say country music, I just want to be clear. The modern country music is not country music. Um, it's pop with slide guitars. Yeah. Or it could be contemporary Christian masked as pop, you know, which isn't a bad thing, but I'm just saying. You know, when I say country music, the people that come to mind are Willie Nelson, Dolly Parton, Waylon Jennings, you know, old school country. Sure. That's what I think about when I think of country music. And uh, I was uh, listening to Willie Nelson um, and even Nora Jones. You know, it's sad to say how, you know, she's represented by a jazz label, but she's more country than a lot of the contemporary country song or singers. And so, in any case... um, yeah, so I was listening to a, a song uh, by Willie Nelson, um, and it's probably one of my favorite songs of his, and uh, Nora Jones covered. So I listened to Nora Jones' uh, cover of that song, then I listened to Willie Nelson's. It was a song called, uh, oh gosh, what was it? Hands on the Wheel. And uh, it was a, it's like a waltz, you know, it was like... 3-4 or 12-8 time, um, and, uh, you know, that song that I played, uh, It Is What It Is, um, that is written in 3-4, because I was inspired by a song that was written in 3-4. <laughs> um, so yeah, when I'm extremely bored, I do listen to country music, and, <laughs> you know, luckily, inspiration struck. Nice. What is it is what it is deal with? Um, is it political? No. Uh, I wrote a different song that's pretty political, uh, which I perform regularly with the Bannerman. Um, it is what it is. Uh, it's pretty much whatever state you are in life, um, or whatever state of mind you're in, in the course of your life, and it's leaning towards the negative. So if you're extremely bored or extremely depressed, um, you know, during the chorus, you know, it ends with the storm will pass. You know, the overall message of the song, whether you're bored, depressed, angry, things will get better. Um, Or sometimes you know it's not going to get better, but you just need somebody to say that. And so that's what the song is about. I was extremely bored, and (laughs) I needed someone or something to get me out of that boredom. And, yeah. So you're almost (laughs) writing the song for yourself, just kind of like your own inner monologue just come to life. Pretty much. Very cool. Well, the next song you're going to play for us is called This Fragile Heart. When did this song come about? This was a song that I wrote 
while I was taking a class at the Old Town School of Folk Music. Um, Which class? Uh, it was a songwriting class. Um, it was taught by Shelley Miller, um, who's also a very good musician. Um, that song was... Uh, well, the assignment was to write a song with the chorus first, and then the verses follow. Um, I've never heard a song like that before, and I've never written a song like that before. And what inspired me to sign up for this class was, well, I was bored. <laughs> <laughs> so after I, I wrote that first song, I'm like, hey, I think I could actually do this. Because, you know, once again, when you write a song, you play it to yourself. It's like, all right, yeah, it's cool. And then the next day you play it again. When you like it after, like the day after or three days after or a week after, it's like, yeah, that's a keeper. So after that, it's like, yeah, I think I could do this. So I figured if I take a class with experienced songwriters who perform on a regular basis, um, I think that can kind of be a driving force. And that class definitely was. Um, and... Uh, so yeah, that was uh, the first assignment. Um, so I had to write a song with the chorus first. <laughs> um, the song itself, uh, it's kind of like... Uh, well, it's hard to explain. Some people think it's a love song. Some people think it's a breakup song. It's, it's, it's neither of those things. It's kind of like, you know... Well, that song was, like, based on a high school crush, you know? Um, you meet a girl, you like the girl, uh, but you're never, I guess, around enough, or the timing just wasn't right, so then we part ways, we meet again, part ways again, and then thinking to myself, damn it, <laughs> you know? I missed a moment there, and so... It was like, that song would have just been like a what if, you know? Because I know that relationships, especially high school relationships, they're not going to last, you know? Or but those if are the they, ones that if they do, stick with you, they follow you yeah. through the rest of your and life. And if they do, that's great, you know? But it's like, you know, when you're that age, it's like you're just, you're just still trying to find out who you are and, you know, what your place in the world is, blah, blah, blah. And we're still figuring that out now. Um, but, uh... But yeah, it's like, we meet, I wish we could be closer, you know, chances are we'll break up anyway, but I just would have been, it would have been nice to see what it would have been like if we actually dated, that kind of thing. So that's what the song is about. All right. So well, let's give a listen to This Fragile Heart. I've only known you from afar To know just who you really are Is weighing on this fragile heart of mine If only you would get back home Then maybe we could be alone For you to break this fragile heart of mine Maybe you remember The bond that we have shared The art that is within you Is what first made me aware Your independent spirit Is something I admire But I was never at the center Of your heart's desire I've only known you from afar To know just who you really are 
He's weighing on this fragile heart of mine If only you would get back home Then maybe we could be alone For you to break this fragile heart of mine We had a brief reunion Foundations weren't laid Negligence and anguish Is the bed that I have made You have your path to follow It's a burden I must bear The distance in between us Is something we now share I tried to forget you But your memory is still a part of me I keep on reminiscing Cause I see you everywhere I've only known you from afar To know just who you really are Is weighing on this fragile heart of mine If only you would get back home then maybe we could be alone For you to break this fragile heart of mine For you to break this fragile heart of mine Do you consider yourself a sensitive person? Uh, yeah. This um, seems like a very tender song very like putting yourself out there and emotional well you kind of have to be if you're a musician i think um you're definitely i think all musicians in general they have to have some kind of emotional outlet if you're not that expressive in person um you know a lot of people like at work <laughs> somebody said that uh you know it looks like my brain never shuts off you know um, like even with uh, relationships, whether it be friendships or romantic, you know, I've always, you know, unless we're doing something together where everybody's having a good time, then yeah, it'll be, you know, I don't know, it's just one of those things. I, I generally am pretty stone faced <laughs> for the most part. Uh, so music is definitely a good emotional outlet. Um, and when you're on stage, you know, you are bearing your soul to the audience. Um, and so, yeah, we definitely have to be in touch with our emotional side. No, this song, is it, is this song about a specific girl? Was this a real situation? Yeah. Does she know? Maybe. You wrote the song about her? Like you still are somewhat in touch? Somewhat. Okay. We are friends on the Facebook. Um, but yeah. Is she gonna, if she hears this, will she know it's about her? Is Maybe. It, was it that big of a life event for her, too? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into the last song. This one's called Idle Symphony. Yeah. 
This one you've played at open mics before, and I recognize the melody right away. It's kind of a favorite of yours. Is it because it's newer, or is it just um, one of your better songs? I think it's uh, one of my better songs. I don't want to say newer, because I've written songs after that. Um, but what I like about playing that, I mean, to me, that one's probably the most personal of the other songs that I've written. It's definitely more introspective. Uh, I'm looking at my life thinking... Where am I at right now, and where do I go from here? Um, that was the inspiration behind that song. Um, and, uh, you know, just certain things about that song, like the uh, the guitar tapping, for example. Um, there's a guitar duo called, you know, they're Rodrigo and Gabriela, mm -hmm. and they are amazing. And considering... I'm a rhythm guitarist. I cued into what Gabriella was doing immediately. And the things that she does with the guitar, with her rhythm technique, well, let's just say that my playing that song is a very sad <laughs> impersonation of Gabriella. Uh, she is unique. And, you know, I, I even remember she was doing like a little tutorial online on some of her rhythm techniques. And... I still can't do it. Even when she slowed it down, it's like, oh, okay, that doesn't seem so hard. And then I try it, and like, yeah, that's pretty hard. <laughs> so you never get into flamenco guitar. I want to. Um, I can see that, because this song definitely can transition over to that. Um, I mean, well, I wouldn't say... Uh, no, my that song has... It's definitely not... <laughs> influenced by flamenco at all i just liked what she was doing with the tapping mm -hmm. um so uh i figured i'll incorporate that um and you know i i guess there's a unique rhythm to it as well but it's definitely not flamenco well it could be flamenco i mean you have that triple strum thing going uh but um but yeah that's probably as far as it goes i mean chord structure wise it's definitely not flamenco uh, is this a song that you play with a band, or is this... Yes, it is. And when you play with the band, do you still do the percussive? Um, it's not as noticeable, because I play my uh, Les Paul. And so, when you tap on an electric guitar, it definitely doesn't make a sound, but I still make the motion with my hand. Um, I don't... Th yeah, I don't think I've ever played... Uh, I think I may have played it once uh, with the acoustic guitar, um, but... Well, with my band with the acoustic guitar, but I guess uh, transitioning from acoustic to electric in the middle of a show, I guess I thought it was a little not too time consuming, but it definitely halted the flow of our overall performance. So I figured I'm just going to go all electric all the time with the bannerman. Um, but if I do a solo show, I'm, I'm bringing my acoustic and yeah. Makes sense. So what is an idol symphony? <laughs> uh, well, idol is, you know, the word is like, it's meaningless, you know? So you don't want 
to hear an idle symphony. You know, you want something, and you know, when you think of what a symphony is, it's it's a large piece of music. So like, you want that to mean something as well. Um, so I don't want my life to be idle. You know, that kind of thing. That's what the song is about. And so, yeah, I'd like to think that it's not idle. <laughs> I mean, you know, that, yeah, that's pretty much what that song is. <laughs> right on. So you've got a, a lot, there's a theme running through of things coming out of boredom and you trying to like figure out what you want to do with your life and, and you want it to mean something. Mm-hmm. What do you have planned? What's on the horizon? What's, what's next for Paul? <laughs> well, I'm going to continue to play with the Bannerman. I'll keep that going as long as I can because they're a great group of people. Um, We've had some changes along the way. Uh, I have a new drummer and a new lead guitarist, but I'm still in touch with uh, the people that left. And, you know, I have no ill feelings towards them. Uh, I see them on occasion. Uh, We have similar social circles and, uh, you know, we're pretty good friends. in fact, I was just hanging out with my old guitarist uh, not too long ago. <laughs> you know, we were just having a beer, playing video games at that uh, headquarters. <laughs> That's the arcade in Lakeview. Um, so, yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the thing about bands, you know, they are supposed to be fun. You know, I don't want people to be obligated to me. I want people to be there that want to be there. And so... When uh, my guitarist and my drummer told me that they wanted to leave, at least they said that, you know, we'll be on there for the next so-and-so month, and then afterwards we're gone. So each of them gave me, like, two months to find a replacement. Oh, so so, nice. so that was great, and, you know, thank you, Matt, Ben. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so with the new lineup, once you guys are solid... Do you have any shows lined up? Any any albums coming out? Recording? Um, I would like to record a few more because I did like the experience. Um, with the original lineup, we were able to record two songs at a Strobe Recording, um, and I like the work that they did. And I thought it was cool to just so you could watch them isolate each track, whether it be the the drummer, the bass player, the different vocals. Um, I think uh, I definitely want to get more recording in. Um, I think if I if I feel we're ready to perform, then I'll try to line up a gig. Um, we're still trying to get a feel for the new lineup, um, but things are coming fairly quickly. Um, the new guitarist, you know, he's also a songwriter, and uh, you know, we were practicing one of his originals, and we liked it. And the more we play it, the better we get at it. And so, uh, so yeah, I think he'll work out fine. Uh, new drummer is also really cool. And so, um, so yeah, um, I try to surround myself with positive people, you know. And if we have a good vibe with each other, if we all get along, uh, I mean, that's important. And, of course, if we're, you know, they're all really good musicians. They're good at what they do. And, uh... So that helps too. So we all get along. We all play well. We play well together. I think, you know, yeah, uh, I'll keep that together for as long as I can. Very cool. Very cool. Um, where can people find you online? I am on the Facebook. Um, so you can look for me. Uh, just type in Paul Ramirez. And if there's a picture that looks anything like me, <laughs> it's probably me. Um, I usually put a band picker up picture on there um but uh but yeah in any case you'll see me um i'm also on uh reverb nation um as paul ramirez or as the bannerman oh i have all the bannerman and i have a i guess an artist page on reverb nation so you can find me there soundcloud um i haven't done much with the soundcloud the soundcloud i was just uh I was dabbling with R&B SoundCloud, so if you look for Paul Ramirez on SoundCloud, you can <laughs> you can hear some couple of R&B covers. Uh, I think I have a Marvin Gaye song and a Boyz II Men song up there. So, uh, so yeah, if you uh, if you want, you could look 
at uh, SoundCloud, you can look at Reverb Nation. Uh, the Bannermen have a Facebook page as well. Um, and uh, I try to take recordings of all the performances that we do. And so you can, you know, if you really, really, really want to scroll back to see the evolution of a band, <laughs> um, our very first video post was from an open mic uh, at Independence Tap. Uh, and this had to have been maybe last summer. Uh, and, you know, uh, we had a good time. Uh, the more performances we've we've got under our belt, the better we got together as a band. And, uh, you know, we started playing, you know, we played the Elbow Room a couple times. Uh, we played at Livewire a couple of times. Um, and, you know, the more we play out, the better we got. Uh, and it's just fun to see. You know, I'm not taking down the old <laughs> videos, even if we played the song before. I just, I just like, okay, this is us way, way, way back when, and this is us now. And it's like, yeah, we definitely grew together. Um, and, you know, more songs will follow. Uh, more performances will follow. Um, and, uh, you know, I look forward to it. <laughs> we look forward to hearing more of your songs and performances by the Bannerman. Before we go, do you have any advice for aspiring singer-songwriters? Uh, don't give up. Um, don't let anybody tell you that you're not good. Uh, don't let anybody tell you that they're better than you. Uh, I think there is no better, I think, when it comes to music. It's just you're different, but you're not better or worse, you know? Uh, if you like writing music and playing music... You got to keep at it, because um, the more you keep at it, the better you get. Um, and you also have to be willing to put yourself out there. Um, if I didn't put myself out there, I wouldn't have met the people that I've met. Um, and I wouldn't have gotten the opportunity to perform at different venues around the city. Um, so, you know, put yourself out there, go to open mics take a couple of classes to brush up on some skills that you know you need to work on because it is work. Um, you know, whether it be vocal training or guitar training or whatever instrument you uh, gravitate towards, it is a lot of work. And, you know, if I find myself not playing my guitar for, let's say, two or three days, the next time I pick up my guitar, I could feel the rust. Um, so you got to be diligent. If you really like playing music, you got to play music, like, a lot. <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's my only advice. Just don't give up. Keep at it. Work hard. <laughs> and how often do you play out every week? How many open mic nights do you hit? Um, I used to go out quite a bit. Um... There's definitely places that I would recommend, um, mainly because I've had really good experiences there. Um, I like going to the Red Line Tap. Um, I like Lily's. I like uh, Mecca Supper Club. I recently discovered way, 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 way out in the western suburbs the Brow House in Lombard. Um, but, you know... Those are just the ones off the top of my head. Um, I think I've been to the Abbey Pub a few times. Uh, either way, the more open mics that you go to, uh, you surround yourself with different people. And, uh, you know, if and when you feel you're ready, if you have enough songs under your belt and you want to actually start a band, you know, you got to go to places where musicians gravitate towards. And a good way to meet musicians is to hear them perform at open mics. Granted, some of them, you know, might be new to the craft and you can tell because if they're obviously nervous and, you know, are kind of hesitant, it's like, all right, well, we'll see how he is the next time he's here. And chances are that person's going to be better. Um, sometimes you meet people and it's like, okay, I want to work with you, <laughs> you know? Uh, 
so I remember meeting somebody that I used to do acoustic shows with at an open mic, and we did a couple of gigs together. So, um, you know, if you really want to put yourself out there, meet other musicians, that's what you have to do. Go to open mics. Solid advice. And above all, don't let your life become an idle symphony. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Paul, well, thanks so much for hanging out and chatting tonight. Um, I know I definitely learned some stuff I didn't know before. And uh, hopefully you've got a, a just swarms of new fans now because of this podcast. <laughs> That's all the time we got tonight. Keep writing and keep playing, Chicago. Mm-hmm.